Thank you. So our agenda is um, yeah, a little bit of about uh, my company, our company. Uh, WebEdge uh, uh, provides a broad spectrum of regular customized uh, training in programming system administration and architecture to our clients uh, to for almost 20 years. So in today's webinar, uh, which would be, which is scheduled uh, for one hour, we will be talking about um, Apache Spark, quick introduction, just uh, for those who are not familiar with the system. Um, and uh, we will look at some of the aspects of using PySpark uh, for data engineering um, use cases, as well as for machine learning. It's a universal tool, quite popular. Um, okay, so that's about our agenda. Logistic-wise, I guess, um, I would uh, welcome your questions as you might feel asking them. I don't think that you will be able to speak, so send me a chat. Uh, we will also have a quick uh, Q&A at the end. Um, PySpark is one of those tools that uh, is probably indistinguishable from magic. It does uh, so many things at a very high level of um, uh, proficiency, as Arthur Clarke once formulated uh, the third law. It's uh, just uh, indistinguishable from magic. Uh, Apache Spark is a general purpose processing engine uh, for large scale data processing. Uh, those people who are familiar with Hadoop, you, are, you know that um, uh, Apache Spark is now a, a prominent um, um, uh, part of that uh, Hadoop uh, product ecosystem. Uh, the primary MapReduce uh, system that is shipped with um, uh, Hadoop um, has uh, some um, uh, not design deficiencies. Uh, it is designed to be absolutely robust, absolutely fault tolerant, and for that it just incurs very big cost in its latencies. And uh, the people were looking for a tool that would uh, address some of the, I guess, concerns that people raised uh, with regard to um, that uh, I.O. bound architecture of uh, MapReduce. So Spark was a response to that. Uh, the main players behind Spark um, listed here and uh, Normally, any distribution of Hadoop uh, currently is bundled with uh, uh, a version of um, <coughs> Apache Spark. Uh, Spark is uh, also available for download as a standalone. So Spark is a platform, and it um, offers a number of uh, capabilities that um, are mutually complementary. Um, Spark was written in Scala, uh, its primary uh, JVM-based uh, system, so Scala gets compiled into, into a bytecode that gets interpreted in the JVM. Um, and later on, uh, Python was added as a language of, uh, of the supported language and R uh, programming language. So currently, people have a choice between Scala and Python. Java is catching up. Uh, Java is now supported at version eight, um, what's gonna happen, the jury is still out. The reason being that Oracle is now trying to pursue that um, monetization opportunity to convert Java into the um, into kind of a, a source of revenue. And um, Scala is currently at version eight, and uh, that's where Oracle, I guess, promises to support eight for a period of time. After that, um, all support will be cut off. So things might change. Probably uh, Spark would add uh, things like R, uh, not R, maybe uh, GoLang or something like that. So Spark um, is nothing more than a collection of uh, useful libraries, and the four are quite distinct. It's uh, Spark SQL, Streaming, Machine Learning, and GraphX. And as you see, they're quite uh, diverse. It's just a broad spectrum of uh, those uh, features and capabilities that Spark uh, offers. And everything is just done uh, on a cluster of machines. So you've got a cluster, <clears throat> it might be quite modest, maybe five, 10 machines, or so up to <clears throat> whatever your system supports. It might be Hadoop, it can be Mazos, it might be a deployment in 
another um, um, uh, system. As long as uh, Spark uh, understands how to talk to, resource, to the resource manager, uh, the main, um, the master of that um, resource uh, uh, scheduling and monitoring, uh, then it's fine. And that's where I guess uh, Spark's uh, strong point comes in. It can, it understands lots of um, uh, um, clustered, um, uh, clustered deployments. Um, so common use cases uh, fall into two categories that we are going to cover. Uh, the first um, and quite prominent one is data engineering. Uh, ETL jobs are quite suitable and uh, many people are using it, um, if not directly, then by using some proprietary tools that essentially are built around uh, Spark. But you can always get to the command line, uh, do the REPL and start using um, Spark directly. Uh, ETL is very important and ETL is part of data engineering. Data engineering is just uh, one of the things that where people wanted to distinguish between data science and data engineering. And uh, it's very practical down to earth thing where you're dealing with data extraction, transformation, uh, loading, uh, probably selection, doing some sort of a priming of your data, just trying to have a sense of data as, um, as suitable in that problem domain. And uh, in most cases, it just lays the groundwork for subsequent machine learning um, 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 projects and uh, data, deeper <clears throat> uh, um, data analysis. Uh, so machine learning is supported uh, through uh, MLib uh, package, uh, which allows you to leverage uh, distributed nature of uh, Spark. And um, you can use Spark for all those use cases and as you understand uh, it's just a, a quite extensive uh, list of those um, 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 uh, capabilities for predictive analytics for classification uh, text, uh, text mining and um, sentiment analysis and uh, data engineering is just part of machine learning it's just an integral part and it's uh, pretty much data engineering uh, is the first phase of uh, any um, sensible or um, a meaningful machine learning project. As I said uh, earlier, uh, Spark supports a number of languages and um, unfortunately uh, there is not, those lang languages weren't created equal, some are more equal than others and we have uh, pretty much uh, competition between Scala and Python. Uh, many people prefer to use Scala because it's extremely uh, expressive language. Uh, uh, it's uh, as fast as Java, it gets compiled into native code and then just-in-time compilation can transfer your bytecode into machine uh, code. And um, Mark Kaderski, the uh, creator of the language, really uh, did a, an excellent job. Uh, but at the same time, Scala, uh, takes a little bit um, longer to learn. It requires what people say, the steep learning curve. Uh, it's quite frustrating. Sometimes it's just um, people just um, feel intimidated by the language, the syntax, the available uh, features. And uh, Python on the other sa side is uh, kind of kind of a uh, very popular language across various domains, uh, particularly in, in machine learning and data uh, engineering. So, um, uh, by the way, Python uh, can be used without any restrictions. There is no uh, whitelist API, uh, so to speak, where you can only use some of the features. Kind of, uh, you can use whatever you want. Um, so, native um, the foreign bridge, the native uh, interfaces, uh, C or Fortran libraries are supported. Uh, so, Python's NumPy is um, is there. So, Spark Shell, it's where uh, you begin your uh, interaction uh, with, um, with Spark. Uh, currently, two prominent uh, shells are PySpark uh, for Python and uh, one for uh, Scala. So they started as uh, kind of a Spark shell, not thinking about uh, other languages, but then later on, so they uh, added uh, PySpark as well. Um, so uh, when you are happy with or satisfied uh, uh, with the results of what you have done in your Apple, uh, in your editor, you can just copy those commands and build uh, um, 
a program application rather than kind of interactive evaluation uh, back and forth uh, between uh, Spark and uh, your shell, uh, you can actually submit that application and run it on a cluster, um, uh, potentially scheduling uh, it and running against uh, large data sets. Uh, Spark Submit, uh, if you use uh, Scala or Java, um, you know, would require your JAR file where you would need to compile your source um, code into um, bytecode in the classes, class files, and then build a JAR file. So it comes with um, a little bit of uh, ceremony, but uh, performance is there, right? So that would be the reason. Uh, Python, on the other hand, is just uh, very um, Productive tool uh, gives you that developer velocity that many people are after. Uh, Python is a popular system, be it on a standalone machine using, for example, uh, scikit-learn, uh, matplotlib, uh, and um, other tools. It's kind of a single thread, maybe multiple thread execution on your local machine. But uh, uh, I guess the, the major, I guess, advantage of uh, PySpark is to be the ability to run on the cluster. Um, so uh, Python on Spark is called PySpark. It's it's um, uh, it's uh, the standard uh, C Python implementation uh, of Spark of uh, Python uh, Python spec, uh, which allows you to run um, Python programs on uh, any of the supported uh, clusters through so Hadoop, Mesos, or uh, Spark standalone. Um, uh, you have to be aware that uh, Python, uh, if it runs side by side with Java, it definitely would um, lose in terms of performance and uh, overall throughput. Uh, but in many cases, what happens, um, uh, your developer uh, velocity is a factor that you have to factor in, that you have to account for. And that is critical uh, when you do uh, machine learning uh, and sometimes you have a very simple task to create a data processing pipeline, uh, kind of a data engineering uh, processing, maybe uh, removing outliers, uh, maybe just uh, plugging in some missing value, uh, arranging data, normalizing data. And in many cases, it's just one of uh, kind of a ad hoc type of job. And uh, Python is extremely well suited for that type of operations. So PySpark uh, doesn't really re implement the whole uh, infrastructure that Spark offers. And uh, what it does, it essentially creates an RPC client which talks to JVM. And uh, that JVM, which hosts a partition of your RDD, would be essentially made available through that uh, stub. Um, so uh, Py4j is the library which bundles a Python module with a jar file, which acts as a proxy. And um, some people have concerns that it's just uh, not, of course, in terms of security, uh, you should run everything uh, in, in your data center where everything would be absolutely safe, kind of a white zone, uh, quote unquote. And that is the way to ensure that uh, no potential hijacks and um, uh, any uh, nefarious actions can happen uh, because there is no encoding except maybe that you implement uh, TLS or any other um, safeguards. <clears throat> and the other concern that people have is the performance. That, okay, we know that Python is not the best tool uh, in terms of performance. It's great to learn and it's great to use, particularly when it comes to processing data using Pandas or similar data frame object, objects. Uh, when we start talking about RPC um, between different systems, uh, people have a concern. But in fact, what happens is that uh, Python would be just sending requests to JVM, which would be just um, a request the invocation on a, on, on a stub uh, with a specific uh, uh, method parameters, and that execution would be done in JVM. So essentially, you'll be just driving things by sending commands. And it was kind of a, a client server where you've got uh, 30 to 70 terminal and you connect to the mainframe. You don't do anything on your dummy terminal. You just pretty much uh, hit, uh, um, <clears throat> hit the keyboard and um, commands are sent over. Okay, so, um, but when you collect the data, when you get the data out of JVM to your local driver process, and of course, um, things change. 
So that's uh, architecture of uh, Spark application when you submit it. Um, so what's happening here? Um, uh, most of you probably know what we are talking about here, but just for the sake of uh, completeness of our discussion, let me highlight a couple of things. Um, I will use blue. Blue is good. So we start our process here. So this is me, right? I'm submitting um, uh, my job from my say laptop, which knows how to talk to the cluster of machines. So the cluster can be standalone, yarn, mesos, anything. So driver program is nothing more, it's just uh, my, uh, my applications that I have created in any of the supported languages. Spark Context is the primary uh, facade interface, which allows me to configure all the settings, how I would like to schedule my job. And then that's uh, Spark Submit tool uh, will take some of the additional parameters, uh, which would um, configure um, the uh, amount of resources to be allocated uh, for every node. So we, we have two physical machines, two physical nodes on the cluster. It can be easily 200, potentially 2000. And what happens is the cluster manager essentially would take the jar file or the Python programs that I, um, I have created and it will submit it for execution. So executor memory is JVM, it's JVM. But uh, in case of Python, there would be also Python runtime running here, that would be Python running and uh, establishing that bridge um, uh, querying the data sending requests uh, to the executor and um, executor has cache uh, for speeding up processing and uh, multiple tasks it can be multiple maps uh, reduce and what's not so results can be collected and sent back and um, that's where i guess um, what happens is at this point um, there would, there would also be a Python program running. And uh, if you start processing data in Python, just be aware that things might go quite ugly. Uh, you can get out of memory exception because you start collecting data from 200 nodes, collecting everything, and then trying to get the data over uh, to your Python program. So things might go wrong. Okay, so. Um, okay, so that's uh, the overall uh, workflow of, um, uh, the processing tasks. Moving on. Um, the fundamental uh, abstraction in RDD when it comes to data processing is resilient distributed data set or RDD for short. It's resilient because it can recover itself uh, going back to the original. Um, again, let me quickly go through this. I will use blue as well. So we start from here, for example, we load the file or we create it, um, uh, we load the file from HDFS, Hadoop file system, or we load it from the local file system, or we uh, generate it um, uh, in memory as an array, as a list of data. And then we start processing the client transformations like map, uh, filter, union. And we start going from one step uh, of processing to another, it's kind of slowly performing all the processing that we need. That's kind of ETL job, or it might be machine learning, but usually it's just the ETL. Uh, lineage is just a way to point to that um, uh, original Big Bang uh, kind of square one uh, uh, transformation that um, brought into existence at RGG. And action comes in, action essentially is, um, um, it's an operation on RDD uh, that uh, requires all the transformations to be evaluated. Everything, by the way, done uh, trans uh, transparently uh, for you. You don't have to be involved in kind of materialization or doing something else. You just apply things at, at the logical, at the source level, and the actual uh, loading of the file, the actual transformation of the file would happen when an action occurs. When the time is for an action, it's just kind of a, a getting a scalar value count of records, saving the file, maybe performing uh, some reduction on the data. At this point in time, everything would be executed and you can get out of memory exception easy because all those things are applied. Um, there will be some discussion about this, but generally if you have a very long transformation path, you can get out of memory exception. So for that, the checkpointing uh, uh, or uh, just uh, you have to safeguard yourself by creating an algorithm that doesn't require that very, uh, very long lineage. 
Okay, again, I understand that some of you, maybe most of you are familiar with those concepts, but again, I have to do this so for, for the sake of, um, of the audience. So moving on. So RDGs are immutable. So when you apply those transformations, nothing gets mutated. The state of an RDD, the changes that you apply, transformations are not happening on the RDD itself. Um, and that's very much in line with functional programming uh, philosophy uh, where you don't do that, be it recursion, be it something else. And uh, a new child RDD uh, would be uh, kind of a, a spun off, would be created. And for that, uh, RDD becomes extremely hungry because in order to build that hierarchy, that lineage of uh, objects, at, certain, at every point there will be an RDD. And since we are processing large, amount of data, even though it's not as critical because every um, task uh, would be dealing with a chunk of data, be it 128 megabytes or something like that, but it can easily just get out of hand. So for that, it's memory hungry and garbage collection is not gonna help you because uh, it'll be just too, too much garbage collection it wouldn't stop. Okay, uh, RDD operations, uh, two types. So we've uh, just quickly looked at what transformations and what actions are, but let's take a closer look. So transformations return an RDD. So we apply a particular, we will see a list of those transformations shortly, where um, we pretty much um, not mutating the state. We just kind of chalk up that operation saying, um, it's, you can think about it as the execution stack. So whenever you invoke uh, various methods in your uh, object-oriented uh, program, uh, you can at a certain point in time set a breakpoint or do a print or a print stack and you will see what uh, which methods were, were called going all the way down to the public static void main right and that is what happens here but those things are kind of a, a just written up they are not executed until an action uh, come along right so those are lazily evaluated transformations and everything seems to be kind of a honky dory. We are just moving ahead. Uh, we are passing on, I uh, think, with some, we, we, we uh, believe so that we are able to achieve the goal. When an action comes in, and at this point in time, the whole thing would just collapse as uh, this proverbial um, kind of a house of cards. So action would, uh, material, would cause all transformations to be materialized. File will be loaded because it's a transfer, it's a actually a lazy related operation as well. So if you really want to check if you can load the file, do kind of a first or take one type of iteration on RDD so that you can get at least something and of course the file to be loaded. Um, so actions and transformations, they are operations, but actions call the whole thing into action. Uh, some of the typical transformations that you will be dealing with uh, in Spark, the centerpiece is RDD or data frame, which we're gonna talk shortly. Uh, it is a data uh, um, uh, object which has API around it and the whole kind of activity, the whole life happens around uh, those, um, those RDDs. So RDD exposes um, uh, methods for transform transforming data. Whenever you see a func uh, passed on as a parameter, that's Lambda function. Uh, Python supports uh, the functional programming through the Lambda um, functions, um, which gets evaluated and which applies logic to RDD. And again, it's not the same RDD, another RDD would be returned. So that's predicate function for filter. It's a map transformation function. Uh, whenever you see this and that, it's just a way to say, we are dealing with two distinct RDD. One RDD, this RDD is the one on which we call the method. And that RDD is the one that we pass on as a parameter. And as you see, it's quite, uh, quite expressive. Uh, some actions, uh, as I said, action would require, uh, for example, how would you calculate the number of elements in, in the RDD? Uh, unless you actually have to get uh, get the whole get um, hold of the data, so you need to uh, load the data, you need to apply transformations and get count. Um, so collecting is uh, a very um, dangerous operation. So in PySpark specifically, uh, be aware that at this point in time, um, you can get out of memory exception. 
Okay, so we can save the, the uh, text file in any of the supported uh, file systems. Again, in addition to being a polyglot uh, resource manager kind of a, um, a translator, it can talk to any of the supported uh, resource managers. It can also talk to different uh, storage systems, be it the native uh, Hadoop uh, HDFS system or S S3 or OpenStack Swift object store. And that's um, just really a hallmark of, uh, of Spark. Uh, which allows you to connect uh, um, uh, kind of pursue those uh, multi-cloud kind of a multi-system uh, strategies. So uh, data partitioning diagram. So when we deal with an RDD, in fact, it's just a logical name, uh, but physically uh, it gets split into uh, chunks of data and every chunk will be loaded in that JVM of the executor processes uh, are running on worker nodes. As you see, in this case, we've got three partitions. And on HDFS, usually it's uh, 128 megabytes as a default. You can set it whatever uh, uh, you want and the uh, executor would uh, take care of this. And uh, what you have to be aware that certain transformations preserve uh, partition boundaries. So we process our data from left to right Right, we load the file and at a certain point in time, not shown after RDD4, we would like to save out. I will um, turn on my spotlight. So we load the data. And let's say we've got three partitions. Uh, we've got three blocks of the data. RDD1 would engage three executed processes, three JVM processes would be running, three Python runtimes talking to those JVMs. So we apply a filter of some sort and um, boundaries will be preserved. That means that the same executed process, the same JVM will be pinned down to that particular node and it will start processing the next task. And it will be very fast. So that's where uh, Spark really uh, shines. In MapReduce, you can force the system to do it, kind of to reuse JVM, but it has never been, it was kind of a hack. It was just was never, uh, was designed this way. Uh, Spark um, takes it uh, to the level where essentially it's just uh, it's part of, uh, of the whole uh, processing flow. And then uh, whenever we start uh, reducing data um, uh, or maybe grouping data by key, at this point in time, uh, uh, the, the first stage uh, ends and the second stage uh, started. Um, new RDD, RDD4 in our case will have different set of partitions because data gets uh, shuffled uh, in order to satisfy that uh, operation. And it's a network intensive operation. Uh, you can end up having uh, more the same or uh, fewer partitions altogether. And those partitions would require new executor processes allocated, so new JVMs. And that's where you will experience um, um, very significant um, uh, uh, delay in order to, to move all the data around. Uh, it's expensive operation. There are certain things that we can uh, improve. For example, use broadcast variables that would help you to avoid that uh, very cost uh, uh, inefficient process, but it's uh, just outside the um, our discussion here. Okay, the pair RDD, um, it's just a very close to what the original MapReduce does. It's a key value pairs, but it gives you the flexibility to swap those. So value can become key. Uh, it's not a primary key, it's not a unique constraint. So keys can be duplicated, no problem. Uh, so a key can be anything. It can be card number, it can be uh, offset in the file, it can be name of the file, whatever the problem uh, at hand you have, uh, you can express, right? and. Um, the usual um, uh, way to create those pair RDDs so that you have a particular key and a value. Value can be anything. It can be string, a primitive, uh, it can be content of a file. So you can use any of those uh, functions, key by map and flat my map. So here's an example of uh, RDD uh, creation. Uh, let's say we wrote a uh, large uh, uh, transaction log file. Probably it's uh, part of your online banking uh, or any other. Uh, system that captures this in the log file. So we've got four fields. And what we would like to do is 
to use uh, any of the supported um, subsequent, uh, subsequently used uh, uh, pay RDD uh, operations, we would like to use bank card uh, number as the key. So what would be involved? And we would like to reference every column in this uh, file, transaction log file, as, um, um, as a content, and bank card, bank card number um, uh, would be the key. So it would just uh, require pretty much one line. So you load the file, and when you load the file, it would be that partitioned view of that transaction log file um, distributed across a, a cluster. So let's say you've got one gig worth of data, one gigabyte is good uh, kind of size for just one application server, and you will have um, data uh, put on Hadoop, as, which you use as a data lake. So there will be eight partitions if you have uh, the data block in the size of 128 megabytes. So there will be eight uh, blocks of data, eight partitions of the file where you would apply the transformation. So it will be very efficient. Pretty much if you have uh, a process that uh, you can, by the way, you can uh, process just one gigabyte locally, no problem. But and you can use probably some threading. Um, if you have eight cores, probably you would be able to achieve the same performance, maybe even better. But what if you have one terabyte worth of data? So all bets are off. And at a certain point in time, certain things can be done locally using probably your staging server or whatever you have in your environment. But at a certain point, there would be definitely no way for you to proceed further because you will just hit the wall uh, time-wise or just resource-wise. You just won't have a machine with one terabyte of data. Uh, you can do a kind of sequential processing, but that's um, it will depend. Uh, so we can do the key buy. Uh, so key buy is just a way to say, I would like to extract one column from that file and make it serve as, as the key. So what happens here, Lambda is the way to uh, pass on that uh, behavior. That's the way functional programming works, which we're not discussing here. For every record, R uh, is um, a presentation with placeholder for every row from the transaction log file. So we perform splitting because we've got uh, comma delimited record and we select the fourth column. Uh, Python is um, uh, zero based uh, language as, as C, uh, which is a pain. Um, and uh, the fourth column would be used as a key so what we get as the result of this processing, we will, we will have a pair RDD, where the key will be bank card number. Easy, right? Just one line. So now let's say we will build ourselves a nice shiny pair RDD, so what's next? And the whole thing, the whole uh, kind of dance was around uh, getting data properly laid out for subsequent operations like count by key, group by key, join. So if you, uh, uh, compare that with SQL, you'd recognize that group by key essentially is just we are grouping by a particular uh, value, let's say it's a month, right? Count by key, it would be the same grouping and in the select statement, we would have count for that month or uh, geography or uh, branch, whatever the case might be. Again, very straightforward, very easy to use and uh, Python, PySpark does it with just flying colors. So let's take a look at how you would uh, count uh, or find most frequently used words. It's a canonical example um, that uh, um, just showcases what you can do in Spark. So we load the file from any of the supported file system and it contains lines. So you can have the whole Wikipedia <coughs> or British Encyclopedia here. So we perform flat map. Uh, those, those operations are methods which are invoked on, let me just highlight here. Which color? Blue. Yeah, it looks like blue is good today. So flat map, uh, it's a method which is uh, invoked and that's, that's an RDD. It's just a way to invoke that API methods on RDD. And that flat map, map essentially takes that uh, a parameter and tokenizes everything, all the lines in that text file that we've just loaded. And it just creates some, just one single continuous uh, uh, logically continue, uh, uh, contiguous uh, uh, list, which is actually broken into partitions and spread across the machine. So we continue, that is a continuation, right? Uh, with applying another transformation. So that map would apply 
to the RDD, which would be the result of this transformation. So this, uh, we are talking about transformation at this point. So we've got an RDD and what we do, which is kind of uh, sitting somewhere in memory, not visible to us, but uh, it's just a result of that transformation. And the map would apply another lambda. So that um, X would uh, be a word in that uh, text and one is just uh, the way my produce works. So essentially you associate, it's a tuple where every keyword would be associated with one. You can have multiple um, ends or multiple uh, words of the same meaning uh, like uh, Java, but every word would be emitted, every Java would be emitted with one. And then it would be the responsibility of uh, um, reduced by key to perform that aggregation. So you do reduce by key, that, that is a tuple, that's a key value. <clears throat> uh, when you perform this operation, it's essentially tuple, which will be passed on to, um, uh, uh, to the subsequent operation. So processing happens like this, from left to right, but in our case, it's from top to, to bottom. So X and Y would be just one, right? Uh, uh, X would be carrying over the result. And for every word, we will be counting those ones. And essentially we will find the, the overall count. But how do we find the most frequently used words? So, so far we've just done the counting. So that's another Lambda thing, uh, which allows us to perform sorting by key and we take seven, we can take five, maybe we can take three top elements from that and we can print it out. Again, I'm not going to spend more time on what it does, you have slides, and um, just look at it, uh, get your kind of uh, hands dirty. It's uh, really um, straightforward uh, reads as English. Uh, Python is great at that. So Spark SQL is a module. Uh, in addition to being a sort of a SQL uh, type of interface, it, uh, it does significantly more. It gives you uniform programming API to work with structured data that can come in a variety of uh, file formats. So it supports uh, CSV, JSON, ORC, and uh, you can also connect to a JDBC source and pull out the data and process it as if it was SQL. Not exactly like SQL, but it just gives you a way to uh, treat the data as if we're just using, using the uniform, uh, uniform API. So data frame, uh, lies at the center of uh, Spark SQL, and uh, that's the overall trend that uh, eventually looks like uh, data frame would uh, take over um, RDD. RDD would, uh, it's currently kind of represented by data set, and that data set, data set essentially just exposes that functional programming API uh, that comes from RDD. They re-implemented those methods. So we've got uh, everything what we've just discussed, key by, and everything uh, is available. But on top of that, data frame organizes data into named columns and you can associate every column with a type. Pretty much you create a DDL, uh, data definition language uh, for data frames. It's sort of a small a relational table um, or tabular store. Uh, so they borrow the concept uh, from R and Pandas. Pandas borrowed the idea from R and data frames are extremely popular in machine learning as well. So here's an example of how you would construct and use a data frame. So that's how we build the schema. This is PySpark. So struct field is the way to define every column. That is what uh, you do in DDL. Uh, create table full, uh, uh, column name, column type, uh, possibly constraint, nullability. So that's what we do here. We've got, um, I guess, four columns. And those are just fields, it's an array of fields. And in order to build schema, uh, we take that array and we pass it on to struct type. So that construct essentially produces schema. It's kind of a factory method, a factory um, object. And then we will have access to SQL context. It's just either a REPL will give you a programmatically uh, created, available to you uh, in Spark submit application, you will need to create it. It's just a one-liner, really. So we create a data frame. We take an RDD, which we created uh, uh, somewhere, um, and we just mount schema on top of it. And now we have very nicely 
organized data where every column, so RDD in itself is just raw data. It has no idea what it is. Uh, it just delegates everything to, uh, to the developer. It's kind of a, a, just a agnostic of, of, of its uh, entity. And in order to make it an entity, it would be the responsibility of the developer who works on this uh, task and uh, schema essentially defines how you would like to treat your data. What would be the column type? Well, of course, uh, certain things might go wrong. Um, and for that, you have nulls, um, if not exceptions. Uh, and then after all that preparatory work is done, uh, you can start using SQL-like approach. You have that select statement, which is just a way to say, um, I would like to retrieve those three values. So that's kind of a projection into your data. Your data can come from um, uh, JSON document, uh, from uh, uh, Parquet file format, and we can apply filter. So filter is sort of a, like where clause. As you see, there is no where, and it's just uh, not a big deal at all. Uh, filter would apply uh, that operation, uh, that predicate to the result of that selection. So we performed like vertical slicing, and then this is horizontal slicing with filter. Uh, that's the way to, to perform uh, filtering uh, uh, with two predicates. As you see, it's very similar to what you would expect uh, from a standard SQL statement. And we display 10, 10 records out of that. We can have like 10 billions records returned, but uh, we are limiting ourselves. So then uh, let's say we just loaded file um, uh, through RDD, maybe we loaded uh, from HDFS, but now we can save it as JSON. And uh, data, the data frame API conveniently offers to use it uh, right object uh, and data frame right, uh, which has lots of uh, good um, useful methods like JSON, CSV, uh, LibSVM. And then when we're done later on, probably uh, next day, maybe a month from now, you would like to use this file and that's what would be involved. You would re read it as JSON because it was saved as JSON and system would understand that there are name, month, size, if you will perform introspection, if you'll find the keys, the properties and the values would be made available for you to use through that um, data frame, which would contain your JSON data. <clears throat> so machine learning, um, there was some confusion um, as to what is the name. Uh, they started with spark.ml, that's Scala API. And uh, they had MLib, but uh, currently they're referring to the whole new API, ML as MLib. PySpark <coughs> um, um, does not support everything, uh, but it does a good job uh, with what it can get its hands off. So Spark ML, um, it's what uh, <coughs> is based on data frame. Um, and um, uh, data frames, uh, generally, they have been created to support machine learning, but it looks like uh, it's, uh, it's a very small performance hit uh, compared to raw RDD if you <clears throat> want to have some meaningful processing. And usually enterprise use cases require that you have some sort of uh, uh, meta information with every data. Uh, so data frames help with that. Okay, so um, what can I say about this slide? That's pretty much it. Uh, here's an example of a k-means. Um, k-means, it's an uh, um, unsupervised machine learning algorithm, which is just a very fancy name. I don't believe in that machine learning when it comes to just data processing, machine learning, k and I don't know, maybe random forest. It's just statistical analysis of your data, really. Uh, machine learning probably would be more advanced um, where we would use, uh, I don't know, things like uh, tensor, TensorFlow type of thing, Keras. Um, that's just pretty much finding uh, distances and grouping the data. And uh, that's a very straightforward operation that um, falls under the category of machine learning, but in fact, it's just a very nice use case for uh, data engineering, because that's how you would probably start grouping data, trying to find the centroid, the center of, uh, of where it, around which data gets um, uh, co coalesces. So we've got uh, a way to load the data from a variety of format. LibSVM uh, is a very popular format uh, for machine learning. And we load the data and then uh, we invoke that k-means uh, uh, co uh, kind of a factory, uh, it's kind of a constructor, uh, it's kind of a, it uses a builder 
um, uh, pipeline. So we said uh, 10, um, it's unsupervised machine learning. So we have to give at least something. We just say, we expect that this data uh, has uh, 10, um, um, 10 groups, so 10 centroids, 10 uh, uh, kind of a silos. Probably it's kind of 10 categories of your customers that you're after. Uh, you would like to, it can be nine, it can be, I don't know, five. It's uh, one of those factors that uh, you can modify. That's your knob, that's your dial. And then you will um, take the data, training data, and you try to fit your model. So the system at this point in time will traverse your data and it will create a model which would identify certain patterns. You might be wrong with the number of 10, probably there is fewer. And the system eventually will tell you, we're not talking about this um, topic or kind of getting the error and the cohesiveness of, of the data and things like that. And then you can start using predictions. Predictions would essentially tell that test data for every record where it belongs, which category it would belong. So in our case, we've got 10. So 10 is the number of those, um, it stands for the K. K essentially just number of uh, those clusters that you, or classification points. So transformation would do that predictions and you can start um, checking the uh, accuracy of that. Probably at this point in time, you will change it uh, to um, maybe down or up, or maybe you, you'll be satisfied. Of course, your business um, equipment should be uh, involved and you should um, uh, make a decision based on your previous experience. Okay, so that's, um, I guess, pretty much it, what uh, I would like to do as part of the presentation. Any questions? So put your questions in the chat window, we, and I will take care of those.